In the book, A Soldier of the Great War, there are two characters that we meet at the very beginning of the novel, an old man and a young man. And they're journeying together on this road. Mm -hmm. And as the book unfolds, you realize that the older man is telling the younger man mm -hmm. stories about his life through when he fought in World War I, but pretty much from the time that he was a young man till today. Mm. And the, the younger man, as he's experiencing this, he is realizing that looking at his life in mm -hmm. narrow snippets allows for the greater picture to make more sense. Mm -hmm. And there's a beauty of the story, especially as we think about risk and return over a long period of time. Mm -hmm. When we look at it at a really fine detail, mm -hmm. risk can look really volatile. Mm -hmm. Whereas over long periods of time, lo risk looks very different. Right. And so as we think about today, we're, we want to take a deeper dive into equities and fixed income mm -hmm. um, and really looking at risk and return over that long haul. Right. Because most of the investors that we work with are invested for long periods of time. Right. And so it's easier to look over those stretches rather than just saying what's happening right now. Right. So Spencer, you want to dive us into, you got a couple of examples about equity and fixed income and, and risk there. So again, we come back to equity fixed income, equity investments for owners. I want to give you one example of what it looks like to own a company kind of from the outset. Yeah. So let's say you've got a buddy, Jerry. Jerry is really good crafting different things and he finds that he can craft custom knives and sell these in the marketplace to culinary enthusiasts. He can sell it for a nice profit. Well, he realizes that if he bought one piece of machinery, that he could do a lot more of this. Mm. He needs $100,000 uh, to buy that one piece of machinery. And, and so he says, well, if, if you'll invest $100,000, then I will give you 10% of my company. So you become a 10% owner on that $100,000 investment. And his estimate is that he can make about $100,000 in profits annually mm -hmm. from that having that new machine as a part. So as a 10% owner, you get 10% of that $100,000. So $10,000 in that first year if he hits his mark. Right. So let's just say that he does. In that first year, you get a $10,000 dividend distributed to you from those profits. Let's say things that go really well in one circumstance. And he continues to be able to add to his capability, he takes some of the profits and reinvests them in his mm -hmm. company. So he has now more machines, more capacity to create those custom knives, sell those into the marketplace. And let's just say that grows 10 times over the course of a number of years. Why, if his profits are a million dollars after a number of years, then 10% is $100,000. That's mm -hmm. your initial investment. You're yeah. getting paid out that dividends yeah. every year. Well, let's say there's a group of people that get pretty interested in what Jerry's doing and they say, well, we want a part of this. And he says, well, if I could get another $5 million of investment, then we could really scale this, not just with machines, but with people. Mm -hmm. And what that would be uh, potentially would be an initial public offering, an IPO of sorts. So he would be selling off shares of the company in a public way, mm -hmm. um, but he would be raising capital so he, he could continue to expand. Right. Now that's the best case scenario yeah. in that circumstance, but you could see your investment really, really grow over time in an exponential fashion. Yeah. Um, the flip side of that, of course, is what if things don't go so well? Uh, what if Jerry has mistimed the market? He may be really, really good at mm -hmm. what he does. But let's say there's a competitor that moves in and says, hey, we like this marketplace and they're much bigger right. and they can produce goods that are of the same quality, but they underprice mm -hmm. where Jerry's at. Let's just say that first year, instead of making $100,000, well, now he only makes $10,000. So you get a $1,000 dividend. Then let's say they really go for it and they continue to underprice him. And Jerry says, I, there's, there's nothing that I can do even to keep up and to make money. Right. Say that second year, you get no dividend. And then in the third year, the cash flow is so bad that he has to shut down the company. And by that point, that $100,000 machine that he's bought with the funds that you invested mm -hmm. is obsolete. Yep. So there's no value there. So out of that $100,000 investment, you got $1,000 in dividends and nothing else. Mm. So that illustrates, again, the, the upside is very, very significant. You're an owner. 
The right. downside is also you can basically lose everything you've yeah. invested yeah. because you're the owner. Right. Um, now, if we think about that, <clears throat> Of course, we're never going to advise a client just to invest in one company. Right. Uh, we want to see a diversified portfolio of investments, uh, but that that does give you a sense of the opportunity for growth over a period of time. We think about the flip side and and fixed income. What would be an example there as a lender? Let's just say you've got an Uncle Bernard that comes to you and says, "Hey, I need to borrow." $10,000 and I'm going to need it for the next five years. I'm going to be able to pay you off in five years because I've got <clears throat> funds coming in then, but I'm going to need it until that point. Uh, you may think that your, your uncle is trustworthy. You may say, okay, well, I'll lend you those funds, but I'm going to need an interest payment mm -hmm. for that. I need, to, I need to be compensated for my lending you these funds. So you arrive and let's just say, again, you come up with and an interest rate that you think is fair, let's say it's 10%. He's going to pay you $1,000 every year for those five years. And then he's going to pay you the principal, the $10,000 back at the end of five years. Uh, the nice thing about that is uh, you're going to get interest over the course of time, yep. and then you're gonna get the principal back. So unless he declares bankruptcy, he should be paying you off those funds. Yeah. It's the same thing if you're lending to a government or to a company or to another institution, provided that they don't go under, they right. should be paying you off. Now, of course, in our fictional example here with your uncle Bernard, um, you know his, his uh, maybe character and credit quality uh, far better than other people do probably. So if your friend Cindy comes over and, and you realize, hey, I need that $10,000 for something else, I, I want it now rather mm -hmm. than um, you know having it just uh, loaned it to my uncle Bernard. Right. If you say, hey, Cindy, take over this lending situation. You give me $10,000 and you can get the payments from my uncle Bernard. She may say, I, I'm not so comfortable with that. I don't know your uncle Bernard very well. <laughs> yeah. But if you've lent to the US government or you've lent to a big company that you know is, that many people would, would expect at least to be uh, have a high credit quality and, and have that note, that uh, bond, be one that could be transferred, then it's much easier to go to your friend Cindy and say, okay, well, the U.S. government is paying me 4% yep. on this 10-year U.S. Treasury. Would you pay me um, a, a reasonable uh, amount for that $10,000? It might be 10000 or it might be something very, very close to that amount because right. If she takes over that bond, she's going to know, or she's going to have a high level of certainty that uh, that she's going to be paid off. There. Right. So those are the two types of investments that we're really talking about here. The beauty of this, as we think about publicly traded investments, is <clears throat> you can trade with people all over the country, even all over the world. Right. Uh, these stocks and bonds. So. It's not as though you're locked in, you know, with your friend Jerry. You know, if you made the initial investment, you're probably stuck with him, <laughs> uh, you know, going forward, unless something unusual like an uh, an IPO happens. Right. Uh, there. Same right. thing with your uncle Bernard. But when we think about investing in publicly traded stocks and bonds and doing so with thousands of different investments, that's how we diversify yeah. this. So as we think about the risk conversation, one of the things that we want to come back to is we need to diversify up front. Yeah. Uh, now, secondarily, as we think about this, we want to provide some context for the risk of stocks in general mm -hmm. and bonds in general or owning and lending. Right in U.S. stocks and bonds. Well, Spencer, thanks for walking us through those two examples. And the importance of diversification really is helpful to see as we looked at those examples. So when we look at the broad stock market mm -hmm. and history over time, mm -hmm. how, do we, how does history tell us about the risks of investing therein? Yeah, well, again, as stock owners, we are owners of equity investments. And if the economy is struggling or uh, we look at the environment and it is fairly negative and investors are pessimistic, mm -hmm. they may be selling stocks. There yeah. may not be as many people that want to be buying at that moment, which can depress the price of stocks. Okay. So there are, are many periods in history where this is the case. We look back all the way to World War II and we see that about 16 times the stock market has dropped 20% or more. Hmm. So if we think back to World War II, again, that's every five years or so. On yeah. average, we're going to have one of these episodes where, where we see a 20% drop in the 
price of the stock market as a whole. Right. So as we think about this, one of the things that we come back to is we don't want to be tempted to sell stocks at a loss. Right. You know, it's often been said that the stock market is the only market in the world that you can go in and it can be on sale and people can run away from it <laughs> instead of you know buying into it. Yeah. So we want to recognize that we want to put together a plan that we're not tempted to do that. Right. We want to know that there's going to be some drops like this. So 16 times again, I want to hit three of them quickly because these were the worst drops that we've seen since World War II. So from early 1973 until October of 74, the U.S. stock market dropped 48%. Okay. Um, we had stagflation in that era and it took about seven years from the stock market to peak in 1973 to come back to that peak ultimately mm. in 1980. So it took some time for that yeah. recovery to happen. Yeah. Fast forward to uh, early 2000. Uh, the technology bubble. We had the technology bubble burst, we had Enron and WorldCom, the accounting scandals, mm -hmm. and we had 9-11. That triple whammy knocked us uh, down 49% in the S&P 500 index. Mm -hmm. And it took about six and a half years between early 2000, again, to late 2006 to get back up to an all-time high right. again. So a long period of time. Finally, we'll look at the global financial crisis. October 2007 to March of 2009, that 18 month period or so, stock market dropped 57%. Mm. If you had $100,000 at the beginning and you could perfectly replicate the rates of return that you saw there, you were down to $43,000 yeah. after 18 months. Yeah. A huge drop there. And it took about five and a half years to recover. So right. from you know late 2007 to early 2013, uh, before we got back to an all-time high there. So it, the, the drops are not always this severe. Sometimes right. from a, a directional standpoint, they can even be more acute. You know, we think about the COVID lockdown, mm -hmm. a 33% drop in just over a month. Now, right. the recovery was quick there. It was by the end of the year, we, we had seen uh, the full recovery happen in, in the stock market as a whole. But there can be these periods where we see big drops, we can see our statements go down uh, substantially, and we have to prepare ourselves for that if we're thinking about investing there, and particularly over a 25 or 30 year period, totally. where we might see market drops like this five, six, seven, eight times, yeah. if history is any guide. Yeah. So um, the flip side of that, though, is that stocks, uh, you know, I'll just give you some statistics here. In, at the end of 1970, S&P 500 year-end close was at 92. And the aggregate earnings were at $5.51 okay. a share. We fast forward 50 years, the S&P 500, again, the number was 92. Now, at the end of 2020, it was 37.56. Hmm. with earnings of $136 per share. An amazing level of growth there, both in the right. index and in the earnings right. there. So if we can bide our time, we can see those rates of return that tend to be, that have at least historically tended to be robust, that can offset inflation and, and help us achieve our financial goals. But we have to, we have to be patient yeah. and know that these downturns are likely to happen with some level of frequency there. Right. I remember I grew up in Texas and there's a roller coaster called mm. Titan and you go up uh, far too far mm -hmm. yeah. and then you just, you peer over the cliff, you know, it's coming. Yeah. And so riding a stock portfolio seems a little bit like that. You know, there's going to be peaks, right? But you know, there's also going to be drops. Right. And so it seems like there's that volatility when you expect it, mm -hmm. it's not as scary. It's when it's unexpected that maybe it gets more scary. Yeah, and you know, even with that, to, to a certain extent, every time we see that stock market drop, it's going to be something new and different. Right. We hadn't seen a pandemic for a hundred years that did something like that to the economy. We had never seen conditions quite like the global financial crisis. Right. We had never seen the flash crash, you know, of 2011 before it happened. Right. Um, <clears throat> so all these different pieces, um, it's it's always something new and we can always come back to that idea, well, this time it's different, I'm gonna sell out. Well, actually, you know, do you think that the, the Apples, the uh, Walmarts, the Starbucks, the Cloroxes, the, the companies, right. do you think that they're 25% less valuable mm. than at the beginning of the experience, let's just say if the stock market yeah. has dropped? 
Well, I, I'm going to struggle to say that I think that those companies like you know Walmart or whoever it might be, are they going to really have 25% less income yeah. over time? You know, uh, perhaps, but oftentimes there's a level of pessimism that drives the market maybe down farther than um, would be warranted when looking at the earnings or the, the overall economic situation of, of a lot of these companies. Yeah. So let's take a, a shift here. We've looked mm -hmm. at the equity environment. Mm -hmm. What about the fixed income environment? How does that how does that handle the risks there? Yeah. So if we, if we look back again, going back to 1980, um, we see there's there's just not that many years where the bond market has been down, where mm -hmm. fixed income investments in the U.S. have dropped. So right. 1990. Uh, the U.S. aggregate bond market down 2.9%. 1999, down 8 tenths of a percent. 2013, down 2%. And then 2021, down 1.5%. Now, you know, if we go back to prior to 2022, if we mm -hmm. go back to 1926, the worst year that we saw was down 8.1%. Okay. But of course, here we are in 2022. <laughs> And as we speak, the bond market is down about 13%. We've got you know a month or so before the end of the year as, as we look at things. Uh, but we've seen a big drop relative to what we've seen historically. So right. bonds can drop in value. Um, it can either be because uh, an institution or company uh, goes under and, and defaults on its debt. In our case, it's because interest rates have risen right. and bond prices have dropped in that way. Again, the good news is going forward from here that with rise with interest rates higher, uh, that in, that, uh, that yield that's paid out over time as well will be higher. Um, so just some figures as we think about history, stocks on average going back when we look at the period of 1928 to 2021, and this is data from the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis, um, averaged rates of return over 11% per year in the U.S. stock market. Uh, Treasury bonds averaged 5.1%. Treasury bills averaged 3.3%. So a Treasury bond is a longer term bond. A Treasury bill is a, a very short term investment. Now, mm. if we think about the flip side of that, we, we say, okay, well, the rates of return on stocks were higher than bonds and bonds higher than basically that cash number. What has, what has been the data in terms of the number of years that mm. we see a positive rate of return? Well, Treasury bills produced a positive rate of return in every calendar year. Okay. They just give you a lower rate of return. Yeah. Uh, Treasury bonds produced a positive rate of return 81% of the time, and stocks rose a little over 70% of the mm -hmm. time. But again, the, the caveat there is that the stock market can go down, and sometimes it takes five, six, seven years for it to recover if we right. look at history going back to World War II. So we have to be prepared for that emotionally, mentally, to be able to, to also have the possibility of the rates of return that we've seen that have been, you know, if we look back at history, north of 10% on average over a long period of time. Yeah. So we kind of touched on it when we talked about the examples, but uh -huh. there's the importance of diversification. So what's kind of the next steps as we look at stocks and bonds and risks and returns, what, what do we do now with this information? Well, I, I think some of it is that conversation to really grapple with how much risk am I willing to take here? Yeah because there are clients who have saved and their future financial goals are fairly limited compared to the significant savings that they have. So they have a lot of flexibility in terms of how much they put in stocks or bonds right. because both avenues are likely to give a, uh, an outcome of, of being able to achieve those goals. Mm -hmm. uh, there are other folks that they, they need to have you know, one side or or the other with their financial plan. So we've really got to dive in um, to the risk tolerance that folks have, their capacity to see risk move up and down, and then also how that relates to the financial plan to say, okay, are your risks more situated with inflation and needing to outpace inflation over time, right. or uh, do we need to look at things in a different light? Yeah, well, great. Well, thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Thanks. This content was provided by Retirement Planning Services. We're in Knoxville, Tennessee, and you can visit our website at www.seriousretirement.com. The information in this recording is intended for general educational and informational purposes only and should not be construed as investment advisory, financial planning, legal, tax, or other professional advice based on your specific situation. Please consult with your professional advisor before taking any action based on its contents.